Um, welcome, everyone. Today, uh, we're very pleased to have John Katagawa from Michigan State University. Uh, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics. John completed his PhD um, in the Department of Mathematics, uh, sorry, his PhD in Mathematics at uh, Princeton University in the year 2011. He's then a postdoc researcher at the Pacific Institute of Mathematics Science in the University of British Columbia at Canada. And in, then in the year 2013 to 15, he did three short-term postdocs at uh, Mathematical Science Research Institute in Oakland, California, University of Toronto Berkeley. and uh, oh, Berkeley, sorry, uh, University of Toronto and uh, Fields Institute. After that, he joined MSU in 2015 as a tenure track assistant professor. Jones research interest is in optimal transport, partial differential equation and differential geometry. And in particular, he's an expert in optimal transport. He worked on many types of optimal transport problems, uh, such as optimal transport with bounded domains, um, semi-discrete optimal transport, and the optimal transport problem with storage fees. Uh, he not only interested in analyzing the theoretical regularities of optimal transport from the PDE perspective, but also develop numerical algorithms and study their convergence rate. So today he's going to talk about optimal transport with storage fees, theory and numerics. John, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thanks a lot, Rong Rong, and uh, also thanks, Mark, for the invitation. Um, you know, it would have been nice to meet you in person, uh, but uh, unfortunately we'll have to settle with this virtual setting. Um, so before I start the talk, uh, everything I'm going to be, well, almost everything I'm going to be talking about today is joint work with uh, Mohan Bensel. He was actually an undergraduate here at MSU, and this fall he's starting um, in uh, his PhD at UCLA. Okay, so, oops, there you go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> a, a bit of an outline. So I'm going to start with some background. I'm not going to assume uh, that everyone is familiar with the optimal transport problem. And actually, the thing I'm going to mainly talk about is this um, optimal transport problem with storage fees, which is uh, maybe a, a less popular variant, um, a bit newer. So I'll go through a bit of the background. Then I will kind of throw out some ideas for numerical methods for the particular problem I'm interested in. Um, then I will present uh, our results that we have. Um, well, so there'll be a little bit of theoretical results in the background portion. So the, the third results bulletin point is more on the numerics. And then at the end, hopefully I'll have some time to show everyone uh, a few movies, which I am assuming everyone is here for you know, mainly rather than the talk. So, okay, so let me get started. So the optimal transport problem. So this is the classical one. Um, it's known as the monge kantorovich problem. Uh, the variation I'll talk about here is called the Monge problem. So the basic ingredients we have, uh, I can use my cursor here. So we have two domains in R2, uh, in Rn, X and Y. And then we have two Borel probability measures, mu and nu. These are you know, defined on these domains. And we'll call uh, usually mu the source measure and nu is the target measure. And um, there is a measurable cost function, lowercase c. So this is just a, a function defined on the product of these domains. Um, sometimes you can let it take uh, plus infinity as a value. Then the optimal transport problem, or at least the Monge version of this problem is the following. So what you wanna do is you wanna find a mapping T, which goes from this first domain X to Y, the second domain, it should be measurable, <clears throat> Borel measurable, and it should minimize this expression. And the class of uh, things that you wanna minimize over is all maps with this push forward condition. So um, I want to remind you the push forward condition oops, means uh, if I take the inverse image of a set, right, and then I take its measure under mu, this should equal 
the measure under new. Okay, and this is for sets in Y. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the way to think about this, uh, you think of um, mu as like some kind of a pile of dirt or something. Um, and nu is a hole which has the exact same measure. And you want to push all of the dirt over and fill up this hole. And this cost function C, it tells you exactly how much, uh, whatever it is, maybe it's money, maybe it's energy, something like that, uh, that it'll cost you to move one unit of mass from a location X to a location Y. So then this quantity is the total uh, cost that it will take to transport all of your um, dirt over into the hole. And then this push forward condition is ensuring that you don't miss any dirt and you fill up the entire hole. Anyway, this is the classical optimal transport problem. And there's a variant, or I guess a subcase, which is usually called the semi-discrete optimal transport case. And so in this, you have your source measure is an absolutely continuous measure with some kind of density rho. <clears throat> and then your target measure is some kind of a discrete measure. So it's just a, a finite linear combination of deltas. Um, and your target set Y is actually a finite set. So in this picture, the red dots, these are the locations um, of your target measure. And then this uh, gray scale is sort of like a density uh, map for this row. <clears throat> and then in this particular case, um, what you end up with is essentially like a, a partitioning problem. So um, one way you can think of this is like if you have, uh, say, a bunch of fields and you're, you're making some crops like wheat or something like that. And so the, the density row tells you where you have your different crops. Maybe you have more in certain places. And then <clears throat> these red dots, the Ys, they represent warehouses. So what happens is you, know, you have to harvest all of your crops and then you have to move them and then you have to store them in your warehouses until you can take them to the market. And each warehouse, you've kind of set it up so the total capacity of the warehouses is exactly how much uh, of the crop that you harvest. And then you end up making these kind of partitions uh, where each of these sets, you decide to harvest all of this and then send it to the corresponding warehouse. Okay, so in the semi-discrete case, that's what your problem will look like. And, you know, depending on how you take these cells, right, you may have different costs um, and then you uh, have to figure out which one's optimal. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on what is really a canonical cost function. So uh, if the cost function is minus the inner product um, between two points, then this is like the, the easiest or most basic case, let's say. <clears throat> and for the optimal transport problem, you can see that this is actually equivalent to taking distance squared as your cost, uh, because the, once you expand the, the square, then the other terms will be null Lagrangian terms that drop out. Okay, so anyway, this is convenient to describe. Um, and so there's a very standard uh, existence result uh, that characterizes minimizers. And it really goes back to Brenier, Jan Brenier um, in, the 90, in the early 90s. And later people adapted it to more general classes of cost functions. Um, so uh, I, I'll focus mainly on this inner product cost, but a lot of what I'm gonna talk about does apply to a wider class of costs. So anyway, if we have this inner product cost and the source measure is absolutely continuous, then it turns out there's a convex function, u. So we usually call it the optimal potential, okay? So, I mean, this is just saying it's, a, it's an envelope of affine functions, so it's convex. And moreover, the optimal map is actually given by the gradient of this convex function. So um, this convex function is, you know, differentiable almost everywhere. Um, and so at least this map is defined uh, mu almost everywhere. Okay, and this actually characterizes minimizers. So 
if you have a convex function whose gradient pushes forward the source measure to the target measure, that automatically characterizes optimality. Okay, <clears throat> so this is kind of a classical result. Um, and this applies even when the target measure is not uh, discrete. So what happens in the semi-discrete case? Um, the problem is actually quite nice. So like I mentioned a bit, um, the optimal map is gonna be a, a piecewise constant thing, right? So you're taking your um, uh, partition and then everything inside one particular cell just goes to one warehouse. So at least up to sets of measure zero, your map is piecewise constant. And then that's gonna actually result in this optimal potential U being piecewise affine. So it's gonna be determined by some vector here in our K, and you'll be able to take it as just a, a maximum of a finite number of planes. Okay, so that's gonna be whatever this optimal potential is. So then it's a bit of notation, sorry to, to dump this on you, but um, uh, basically everything can be viewed in terms of vectors in RK. So remember K is the number of points in my target here. Um, so I have a, a given, given a vector in RK, I can define this piecewise affine potential, and then I can define these cells. So these are what are called Laguerre cells. Um, they show up in power diagrams. They're related to Voronoi cells, but essentially, this is the, the ith Laguerre cell is the set of points where the, uh, the, the potential determined by this psi has a uh, slope exactly equal to yi. Okay. So you'll have something like, uh, you know, your piecewise affine potential and then your Laguerre cell, if this corresponds to yi, this will be, well, except for that part that sticks out at the end. So this will be your Ith Laguerre cell, okay? Um, and then, so an important quantity is you take each of the Laguerre cells and then you take their measure under the source uh, measure. So that's the size of each cell that you're transporting. Um, and then you can define this map T psi. It really is determined solely by this vector psi as uh, you send a point in the ith Laguerre cell to the ith point, okay? And well, at least up to uh, uh, almost a set of measure zero, this map is gonna be single valued and it'll actually be the gradient of this piecewise affine thing. So then there are two things you can say. So first thing, if I take any psi and then I define this T psi, and I push forward the source measure, I will get a discrete measure. It's supported on exactly those points, y1 through yk. And then the masses of at each point is exactly the, the mu measures of these Laguerre cells. So they're given by this vector valued function g. Um, and then this characterization under the Brini's theorem tells us that this is gonna be an optimal map. So at least in the semi-discrete case, we have this kind of nice, characterization and, and it, it all kind of reduces to a finite dimensional problem in some sense. <clears throat> okay, so that's the classical optimal transport problem. And so the variant I'm gonna be talking about today is with something that we refer to as storage fees. Um, so the setting is relatively similar. So again, I have an absolutely continuous measure on the source and then I fix my target set, but now I have something uh, which we call a storage fee function. So this is a uh, capital F defined on RK and it can take, you know, real or plus infinity values. And then we have an optimization problem. So uh, the uh, functional to minimize is similar. So again, I'm trying to find some kind of a measurable mapping from my source domain to my target domain. And you'll recognize this first term is exactly this transportation cost that was associated with the optimal transport problem. But now I have an extra term, which is this F of lambda. And now the difference is here, 
whenever I'm minimizing, I'm, I'm not minimizing over this restricted class um, of maps. I'm taking all maps from X to Y. So you'll notice that there's no fixed target measure. So any map from X to Y, if I take that and I push forward my source measure, that'll give me some kind of measure supported at uh, the points YI. And so what I do is I take the uh, weight of that discrete target measure, and then I'll put that into F, and then I'll consider the total of F and the transportation cost. <clears throat> so this may look a little weird, um, but uh, uh, in terms of this um, uh, uh, growing crops and, and putting them in the warehouses story, what you could think of is uh, you are actually renting a bunch of warehouses. And so you harvest your crops. And so each warehouse, the, the landlord's going to charge you some amount. And the amount depends on how much you decide to store in that particular warehouse. So that's this, this F of lambda. So what you have to do is you have to first decide how much of your of each of your uh, crops goes to which warehouse, then the landlord will charge you this F of lambda. And then you also have to pay to transport all of that stuff. So that's the integral term. And then you want to minimize the sum of both of those. So um, this problem shows up in something called Q penalization. So like you can design a city and then you have services like post offices. And there's a bunch of them, but then people might not go to the closest one if they know for some reason that the line is really long there. So the the wait time is like this F, and then you have to think about like how far the post office is, and that would be your transportation cost. Right. Um, so anyway, that's uh, one particular example. Um, so then, okay. So I'll start with like a very basic uh, result. Um, so. Again, I'll focus on this inner product cost, but our result does uh, kind of apply to basically the most general case in that first existence theorem I mentioned. So again, let's say our source measure is absolutely continuous. And then suppose F is a convex function. Then there's a unique minimizer of this transport problem with storage fee. And here, F doesn't have to be strictly convex. Basically, the transportation cost part has some kind of strict convexity built into it. So even if F is non-strictly convex, we'll still have uniqueness. And moreover, there's actually a dual problem. So the dual problem is, um, so, so the maximum value in this dual problem is equivalent to minimizing this uh, optimal transport storage fee. And the dual problem, uh, so you're maximizing over pairs of functions, continuous functions on the source and vectors in RK. So they should satisfy this kind of pointwise uh, restriction. And you are maximizing this quantity where F star is the usual Legendre transform of F. So the way to think about this dual problem, um, there's an interpretation of, there is a dual problem for the classical optimal transport, and then it has this like shipment uh, interpretation. And then it's a similar thing. So instead of, you know, deciding to move all of the, the, the wheat that you've harvested in this setting, you contract it out to some kind of third party company. And what they say is, okay, we're going to charge you some amount to pick up uh, uh, your wheat at each location. And that cost is this U of X. So it's like a, or minus U of X. So it's like a per um, unit weight cost to pick stuff up at location X. And then they say they'll charge you some amount to, to drop it off at the i warehouse. So that's this value minus psi i. But then what they're going to do is they say that they'll pay for your uh, 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 the the fee, the storage fee, and then charge uh, you that amount. Okay. So what's going on here is first, um, if C X Y I is the um, the amount it would cost you to do it, then they're undercutting you. They're saying we'll guarantee that our prices are better than you doing it on your own. 
And then here, this Legend transform is saying that the company is going to optimize your choice for you. So they get, they'll decide where to send the stuff and optimize it and then pay the rental fee, the storage fee, and then charge you for that. And then what they want to do is maximize that amount because that's how much they'll charge you. So this is the total pickup fee. And then this is the drop-off fee plus the, the storage fees. They're trying to maximize that. And then the, uh, this theorem says, well, if they do a good job, they'll end up charging you exactly what you would have uh, paid by minimizing and transporting yourself. Okay, so so you know we have this. Um, in some sense, this is not super surprising. Uh, you can do a kind of Lagrangian duality argument, uh, but the nice thing is this dual problem gives you this um, kind of nice in economics interpretation. Okay, so then. <clears throat> we can uh, again look at this maximizing pair and try to figure out if there's some like nice way to get the get at the optimal map. And so again, it'll turn out that, that the, the function part, the u, will be some convex piecewise affine function. And it's determined by exactly the vector uh, that's the other part in this maximizing pair. So using the same notation as before. And then again, we can construct the optimal map the exact same way. So we construct these Laguerre cells, and then we decide to send everything in the ith Laguerre cell to the ith warehouse. <clears throat> so this part, again, it's a problem that kind of turns into a finite dimensional problem in some sense via the stool problem. Now, um, one thing that's of uh, concern is, is there a nice characterization for the minimum? So you may have noticed if I know the optimal masses that the lambdas that the target should carry, this just turns into a semi-discrete dimensional transport problem. And so one question is, is there a relationship between the actual optimal amounts of the target masses and uh, this mu and this psi? And to the answer is yes. And to formulate this characterization, I need to give this definition of subdifferential. So um, if I have a convex function f, it's subdifferential at a point, it's denoted this way. So it's a set of vectors, and effectively it's just the, the slopes of all of the supporting hyperplanes to the function f at the point x. And now in this case, right, so we have a characterization of the minimizers. So uh, if I have my optimal potential u and I take its gradient, that gives me my map t. And say I take the push forward of the source measure and get this particular discrete measure. So lambdas are whatever masses I end up with. Then this thing is actually a minimizer in my storage fee problem, if and only if the following things happen. So like I said before, this u is actually a piecewise affine function de determined by some vector. And then this vector psi and these weights lambda are related in the following way. So each lambda is the mu measure of the corresponding Laguerre cell defined by that vector psi. And psi has to be in the subdifferential of the storage fee function at lambda. So, I mean, this is effectively just encoding a, uh, a first order optimality condition in the dual problem. Um, so you may expect that because in the dual problem, you're getting this Legend transform. Uh, but at least, um, you know, this tells us something nice. So basically, if I'm able to find a pair of psi and lambda that uh, are connected by these two relationships, then I know that uh, I have a minimizer in the storage fee problem, okay? And this characterization is going to be, it's gonna turn out to be kind of a, a crucial ingredient once we start talking about numerics for this problem. Okay, so I'm going to now transition a bit into the numerical part. 
so um, I'm going to be a little less ambitious for the numerics. Um, I'm going to take a certain subcase and try to figure out if there's a numerical scheme that works for that. And that subcase is what you could call a hard capacity constraint. <clears throat> so if I have some uh, a vector w in rk, where all the components are non-negative, then I'm going to take this particular function um, as my storage feed, f of w. So, so this is um, uh, what's usually known as the uh, indicator function in complex analysis. But I'm saying that the storage fee function is 0 as long as my lambda lies in this particular uh, cube or hyper, hyper rectangle, I guess. And it's plus infinity if you go outside. So um, in, in terms of this like uh, warehouse shipping uh, analogy, you can think of this as the case where you actually own all of the warehouses. So you're not going to charge yourself anything extra. Um, but each warehouse ha obviously has some kind of size constraint. And so you can ship stuff to any of the warehouses, but you can't exceed the capacity. So that, that's each uh, WI is the capacity for each warehouse here. And so it costs infinity to exceed it, which you can't. Um, and if you're within capacity, then you don't charge yourself anything extra. And so one comment, this actually includes the classical optimal transport problem. If you take a collection of weights that actually sum to one, then the only choice is to uh, map exactly wi uh, mass to each um, ith warehouse. And so if the sum to one, then it's doing ex it's the exact same as doing a classical optimal transport where these weights give you the weight of the target measure. Um, so I, I want to mention there's one potential application of this problem for some kind of like uh, I would say semi-supervised uh, data clustering. So you can think of um, yi as like a so. So you have you want to divide some data, which is given by mu, into k clusters, and then each point yi is like a representative element for that cluster. And here you're saying, well, I want to have a hard uh, size constraint on each cluster. But then there's some kind of affinity which is measured by this cost function c, and you're trying to you know divvy up the data into these clusters. So it's semi-supervised because you have to give you know these these yi's which are the uh, representative data points, but um, you don't have to a priori uh, determine the size of the clusters to begin with. Anyway. So um, how can we do some kind of numerical stuff for this particular storage fee uh, problem? Well, um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, what can be done for the classical optimal transport problem. So here, according to this construction with the psi and this Laguerre cell stuff, if I know that I have a target measure like this, then um, if I can find a psi where g of psi is equal to nu, that actually gives me exactly the right optimal map. So it's a problem of finding the root of this vector valued function, g minus whatever the target measure gives me. So a very simple idea is try to do Newton's method to this. And it turns out to work pretty well. Okay, so this is a previous result I have. Um, it's with Conta Mergo and uh, Boris Deber. So um, for, for a wide variety of cost functions, it has to satisfy uh, some conditions related to regularity in optimal transport. So this is a PD thing. Um, for those of you who are experts, these are what are called the Ma Trudinger Wong conditions. Um, and then uh, there should be some kind of like a convexity type of condition on the domain. And I need certain conditions on the source measure. So I have to have some regularity. Helder regularity is enough. <clears throat> and I need a Poincare Verdinger inequality on the source measure. So you can think of this as some kind of connectedness on the support of the source measure. 
So um, I'll try to touch on why that's important later. But then anyway, if that's the case, then we can make a damped Newton algorithm, which converges globally with linear rate, and it converges locally superlinearly, where the rate is related to the regularity of this source measure. So anyway, this is for the classical optimal transport case. And so you might ask, well, why can't you try to do the same thing for the storage fee? Um, oh, sorry. So before I go on, um, there are some previous results that involve the Newton methods. Um, so this first batch, uh, some of these involve Newton methods, um, but these are kind of like discretizations for Mondrian pair equations with certain boundary conditions. Uh, these are restricted to um, <clears throat> the, the setting where you're on the torus, uh, but it gives kind of more detailed convergence in the CK alpha regime. Uh, this is sort of the classical, the uh, the curve Prussner result is kind of the oldest version uh, that exists for, for what we did, um, but it's slightly different because it deals with a Mondrian pair equation with a Dirichlet boundary condition, and that's slightly different from optimal transport. And then so we have our result here. Um, but I mentioned that none of these a priori work for this problem with storage fees. And, and you know, what's the kind of issue here? So the target measure is not fixed in the storage fee problem. It's like part of the minimization. So it doesn't even make sense to look at this particular uh, function, right? There's no fixed new. So what can we do? One idea is we might try to use this characterization theorem. So it's kind of reversing the problem in some sense. So rather than changing around uh, psi to figure out what the uh, transport um, should be, the optimal transport should be, I'm going to actually change around the storage fee function and make it fit my parameter psi, so I get an optimal solution to the storage problem. So what I want to do is I want to find a map that takes size and it gives me w's in such a way that if you remember this is, um, oh sorry I'm missing, uh, I'm missing mu's here. So, so this is the characterization of optimality in uh, the, the storage fee problem. So if I change my storage fee function to be this f defined using w psi, then I want the psi to satisfy the compatibility conditions in my characterization. So sorry, these should all be mu of Laguerre cells here. Um, but that's, that's the condition, that's the characterization for optimality that I have. So then if I can do that, right, I would take that particular psi, I would construct this, you know, T sub psi, and that should minimize the optimal transport problem with the storage fee, where now the storage fee is changed to be uh, using this W psi, okay? And now, right, I really want to find the optimizer when the storage fee is defined by this particular capacity vector W0, so I will try to apply the Newton method to this function w minus this true capacity w0. So I'm gonna like try to change around the uh, storage fee function in order to figure out what's optimal. So unfortunately, it doesn't work super well. And one major problem is um, the storage fee function we're looking at, it's not strictly convex. It's actually really bad because it's flat and then at the edges, it jumps up to minus infinity or plus infinity. So this is geometrically extremely not nice. And then there's also a slightly uh, more subtle issue. It turns out if any of the Laguerre cells happen to be, um, sorry, again, that should be mu. So if any of the Laguerre cells has measure zero, then you get some problems. Um, this shows up even in the classical optimal transport case. But in this storage fee problem, um, it could very well be that the optimal way to do it is to actually completely ignore one of the warehouses. Maybe that's just you know the way 
the like maybe has capacity problems or maybe it's too far or something like that. Um, so it's very well possible that one of these Laguerre cells will have measure zero. So how do we deal with that? <clears throat> it turns out we can do some kind of regularization. So I'm going to replace this uh, zero infinity storage fee by something that's regularized a little bit. And so uh, there's two parameters, uh, this h and this epsilon. And basically what happens is the following. So, sorry, it's very hard to draw. I'm not used to this tablet. So if this is wi, then the original storage fee function, it's zero here and then plus infinity outside. But then um, under this change, what's gonna happen is we replace, first of all, uh, so we shift this interval slightly, and then we replace the flat part by a semicircle. So we get a cost uh, storage fee function that looks like this. So this is a semicircle. And this height is this parameter h. And then we've shifted a little bit sideways to give this parameter epsilon. So this would be um, f uh, uh, w h epsilon. <laughs> OK. So this alleviates both of the problems um, <clears throat> from before. So first of all, we've replaced this flat thing by at least something that's uniformly convex. It still has the jumps at the ends, but we, we don't have any flat parts anymore. That really turns out to help us um, when we're trying to find this function uh, w of psi. And then this little gap of epsilon here, what does that do? <clears throat> so according to this storage fee function, if a Laguerre cell has measure less than epsilon, it will be charged plus infinity for the storage fee. So it's actually artificially creating a lower bound on the size of these cells. So then you can imagine this procedure where you solve for this problem and then take epsilon and h and you know take them down to zero to get uh, the original uh, a, a minimizer for the original problem here with the hard capacity. So anyway. This uh, pays off because we have an explicit expression for what this function w of psi should be. So it's something involving the uh, size of the Laguerre cells and this parameter epsilon. And then there's some strictly convex function. Uh, this is a strictly convex decreasing function that involves uh, psi and h. So basically, if we take this particular choice, then the psi that I, uh, any psi that I put in here will give me an optimal solution when I take my uh, storage fee function to be given by this expression, where w is replaced by w at psi. Okay, so I'm sort of artificially creating an optimizer for each value of psi. So it turns out this is good enough. <clears throat> so let me give you some pseudocode for our algorithm. So I fix an error, which I'll call zeta, because I foolishly used epsilon as a parameter. And we have our two small parameters, h and epsilon. And we have some initial choice of psi 0, which will ensure that um, the, the w that I picked is positive. Okay. So then we define a certain parameter. Um, so uh, sorry, this wi should really be the court, the entries of w0. That's the actual real capacity we're trying to hit. And so what I'll do is the following. So if I take my w of uh, my psi at the kth iteration, and I look at the difference with the w0, which is the capacity I want to get to, if that error is, uh, oh, sorry, this should be zeta here. Uh, if that's larger than zeta, I do the following. One, this is just calculating the Newton direction, right? It's the inverse of the derivative of the, the function I'm applying it to times 
the previous iteration. And then there's a damping procedure. So this is a bit of a technical point. I need to make a certain normalization um, of, of my W. So it needs to have this particular normalization. Otherwise, uh, my W could sort of go off. Uh, sorry, my, my size could go off to sort of infinity. And so one thing you'll notice, <clears throat> if I take psi, this vector 1 is the vector which has 1 in every uh, entry. So if I add a multiple of this vector 1 to psi, then that actually doesn't change the Laguerre cells that the, the vector psi defines. Because it's like taking my optimal potential and then just sliding it up or down by the same amount. It changes the potential, but it doesn't change the cells that I'm using to transport. But it will change W. And so I need to do some kind of damping, uh, some kind of normalization. So what's going to happen is I will take my Newton direction, I damp how far I go by a power of two, then I move from the previous iteration, but then I also have to normalize. So once I have that normalization, I'm going to check uh, different values of um, this L. Oh, sorry, I have typos all, all over the place. This K should be an L. All right, so, oh, I guess I could just fix that. <clears throat> so um, what, I, what I'm going to do here is uh, first I need to guarantee that my W stays positive by a certain amount, and that's determined by this quantity here. And then I'm going to demand that at uh, each stage um, my error should decrease by a fixed amount compared to the previous iteration. And once I am satisfied with those, I will update my, my Newton procedure. So I keep iterating through this, OK? Um, uh, yep. Oops, sorry, this is extraneous here. Okay. So anyway. Um, Right, so, so the nice thing about this damping is the damping size is always a power of two. So I don't have to do anything super fancy. I just have to make sure that I fix my direction. I damp the, the, the movement in that direction. And then I need to do some kind of normalization. Okay. And so it turns out we get a similar result here from uh, to the uh, classical optimal transport problem. So again, these conditions that I mentioned, they're the same conditions on C for the classical optimal transport result. And uh, I'm going to assume that my source density is held or continuous, but I don't need to assume that it has a Poincaré Bernier inequality. So if that's the case, that, that mapping W that I uh, constructed is actually going to be C1 alpha. And then this algorithm, uh, again, it has this local uh, superlinear and global linear rate of convergence. Okay. So one kind of very uh, nice thing about this is the support of your source measure doesn't even need to be connected for this particular algorithm to work. And that's definitely not the case for the classical optimal transport uh, algorithm, at least the version that we um, previously came up with here. OK, so um, I just want to, I am I'm a little low on time, so I just want to briefly mention some of the ingredients that go into the convergence rate proof. <clears throat> So you basically need two things. You need a C1 alpha estimate on this mapping W. So the mapping that you're applying the Newton method to. <clears throat> so this is because we need some kind of um, quantitative uh, estimate on um, the damping part. And then we also need an estimate on the operator norm of the inverse of D of W. 
Okay, and that goes into the Newton direction because the Newton direction is constructed um, using the W inverse. Um, so implicit is that you actually have to show this DW is invertible here. That's part of the proof here. So um, this first part actually comes straight from my previous paper with uh, Mergo and Thibert. And this uses the PDE theory. So essentially what happens is um, our W is constructed from some explicit function, which is you know, nice and differentiable times these uh, measures of these Laguerre cells. So the Laguerre cells are essentially uh, intersections of, in our case, half spaces whose boundaries slide around as you change the parameter psi. So then you can do some kind of like co-area formula type of argument, um, but actually you need the sides to intersect in a reasonably transverse way. And that's where the PD regularity theory comes in. Because um, uh, if you're familiar with Caffrelli's regularity theory for modular pair equations, the convexity of certain sets really comes into it. And that's the part that uh, shows up in a, in a very kind of uh, in crucial way here. But at least for our result, the C1 alpha estimate here is effectively just uh, transplanting the estimate from my previous paper and then um, putting it together with this. <clears throat> On the other hand, so the estimate for this inverse, uh, it's something that depends on a bit of graph theory. And um, this is where this Poincare Verdinger inequality comes in. So in the classical optimal transport case, if you have this Poincare Verdinger inequality, then what happens is you can look at a, a certain weighted graph. And if you, uh, so the weighted graph is built on the target point, the points in the target domain. And if you construct the weights the right way, the weighted Laplacian, uh, the weighted graph Laplacian is going to exactly be the derivative of that map G that came up. And so if you have a poincare verdinger inequality, you can use that to control the eigenvalues of this map. Now, DW, it turns out, is actually not a symmetric matrix. But what happens is you get some term that involves uh, the derivative of that map G, and then some explicit uh, strict, uh, the derivative of a strictly uh, convex function, or sorry, the Hessian of a strictly convex function. And so the regularization process we've built in actually gives us some kind of nice uh, strict convexity properties. And so combining them with the convexity of D of G gives you this estimate. And so uh, that's why, so, uh, I, so it's not a very satisfactory estimate uh, uh, explanation, but um, we're able to bypass this poincare verdinger uh, uh, requirement in our particular case, okay? Um, so let me just wrap up very quickly uh, because I think I'm over time uh, with the pretty pictures. Okay, good, it's moving. So first, um, this is uh, a case where our source measure, it's identically one on this outside square. It's zero inside this white square. And then you kind of vaguely see these blue dots. So there's a 30 by 30 grid uh, of points over here um, that are supporting the target measure. So I ran our older version and our new version. And you can see they, they uh, run to the same error and take roughly the same number of iterations. So this is a source measure which does have the Poincare Verdinger inequality, um, but at least uh, you know it's it's um, reassuring to see that our our algorithm will handle this case um, in a you know rough. It's a little slower, but uh, in a roughly reasonable amount of time compared to the old one. Okay, the next one is where things get interesting. So in this example, 
the measure, the source measure is zero on this whole strip here. And then it's one on this outside. So in particular, the support is not connected. So this thing doesn't satisfy a Poincaré very quality. And it takes more iterations, but you see that our algorithm sort of gives you something reasonable, right? It's kind of growing into these cells. That's what you get. But our, our old one, it just kind of gets stuck after three iterations. Um, so there's this lack of strict convexity uh, that's going on in our old algorithm. And so it just gets stuck in a certain spot and it never moves. So that's good. We're happy about that. And then the last example. So this is an example with some kind of storage fee. Um, so the, the source measure is the same as that first example here. Um, and uh, so we have some random uh, capacities that are generated on this collection of uh, target points in the lower left. And you can see it gives you something that seems, well, pretty feasible, right? Um, the, you'll notice the size of the cells have variations um, because you're not mapping to a uniform uh, measure in the target. It's subject to this uh, storage fee constraint here. Okay, so I think I've gone over. So let me end here. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for your attention and letting me speak. Yeah, thanks a lot, June. Uh, sorry, Ron, Ron, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks for the very nice talk. I really appreciate you explain such complicated stuff using friendly language. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. I think uh, oh. uh, Bohan Zhao was asking if you could explain a little bit more about what the red contour plots explicitly mean in the simulations that you were just running. Ah, uh, yes. OK. So here, um, each of these uh, regions that are bounded by the red uh, lines is one Laguerre cell. So. The, the white cells are actually mapping to one of these blue dots down here. That's what the optimal map will take to one of the, the target locations. 